Hello, uh, welcome to Approach to the Intracranial Fossa in Christigalli. Uh, I'm Mark Rosen uh, from Thomas Jefferson University. I'd also like to thank Dr. Parcell, who uh, aided tremendously in preparing this uh, presentation. I have nothing to disclose. We'll start out with a little outline and uh, go through all of the um, components of this talk. Um, there's a wide range of pathology that arises in or involves the intracranial fossa, and these can be primary CNS tumors, benign and malignant sinonasal tumors. There can be intracranial extension of sinonasal disease and uh, CSF leaks, meningoencephalocele,s and most of these are predominantly surgical disease with a few exceptions. Um, we're all familiar with the endoscopic approach. Uh, and all of us know that it leads to reduced morbidity compared to the open approaches. Um, and these approaches have evolved greatly over the past 15 to 20 years. Uh, in the early days, the endoscopic approach was condemned for its lack of uh, visualization, safety, and ability to uh, create a watertight seal and close uh, cranial base defects. Um, most of those problems have been um, resolved, as we'll talk about. But the thing that's important to recognize that the approach is minimal, but not the tumor resection. And the structures that are risk at risk and the uh, um, critical structures that are um, exposed are just as difficult as with the open approach. And again, the degree of resection should never be compromised uh, because we're doing something endoscopic. And if anything, the newer approaches have shown us that the degree of resection is probably better than open approaches due to the improved visualization. The early techniques, as I mentioned, focused on safety at the expense of function. Uh, most of us were very concerned about complications. Uh, a lot of these programs were getting shut down if they weren't able to have, uh, uh, if they had high complication rates or CSF leak rates. And so early on, uh, we did fairly aggressive and destructive approaches uh, just to make sure we had good exposure and could safely perform these procedures. Now that we've established that these can be done safely, uh, endoscopically, and minimally invasive, uh, the new goal is to be minimally destructive and try and preserve as much nasal and uh, function and anatomy as possible. Anatomic considerations, uh, the boundaries of the intracranial fossa go from the frontal bone, uh, the posterior wall of the frontal sinus to the lesser wing of the sphenoid. Uh, it's separated immediately by the Christigalli and Falk cerebri. And of course, it contains uh, many critical structures, including the olfactory bulbid nerve, uh, the optic nerves, the internal carotid arteries, and the anterior cerebral arteries and branches. Uh, in terms of workup, uh, CT and MRI are complementary and sessional for the workup of uh, most of these pathologies. Uh, the CT demonstrates bony detail, uh, remodeling. It gives us a roadmap for how to approach uh, some of these more difficult areas. And the MRI reveals soft tissue involvement and can dis differentiate it, uh, cystic versus fluid um, um, uh, uh, structures, as well as giving us a good uh, idea of what the vascular anatomy is. And if there's a malignant lesion, uh, PET-CT is useful to rule out any regional or distant metastasis. This is an example of how complementary uh, CT and MRI can be. Here's the CT scan of a malignant tumor of the intracranial fossa. And you can see that the CT does give us the bony anatomy and gives us a roadmap for how to get there, but we can't really tell one what the consistency of the tumor is. And also we can't tell what the status of the dura and infiltration of um, uh, bone or orbit. Here you can clearly see that it's a um, cystic and solid uh, mass. There's expansion, but there does not appear to be erosion of the dura or the uh, periorbita, uh, and again, gives us much better soft tissue information, whereas the um, CT often gives better anatomic landmark information. And typically when we do these cases, we'll use the CT navigation for the approach and the MRI for the tumor resection. In terms of how they further manage these patients, um, many of these lesions can be uh, identified based on their uh, imaging characteristics. However, some uh, that are either benign or malignant uh, cannot be differentiated on uh, radiographic images alone. Uh, for these patients, biopsy needs to be performed. Um, and this can be performed in the office or in the operating room. 
Uh, most people recommend imaging prior to biopsy uh, to rule out a meningoencephalocele, although I, I would tell you that uh, if I see a tumor that looks predominantly solid and that's either exophytic or uh, pedunculated with no evidence of uh, vascular or uh, CSF, I will biopsy it in the office without imaging. Uh, and again, uh, one of the hallmarks of treatment of malignant lesions of the anterior cranial base is to avoid aggressive debulking at the time of the bio biopsy. Uh, the first shot's the best shot, and if you uh, do massive debulking, you clearly compromise the outcomes. Uh, the in-office biopsy, as I said, I will often do this if it looks like it's a fairly safe um, lesion. Uh, the rule of Rosen is something that I uh, tell the residents and fellows. And basically in the office, I'll use some uh, local on a uh, small needle, uh, 26 or 28 gauge needle. <clears throat> if there's a significant amount of bleeding when I do the injection, then I do not do a biopsy in the office and we'll take them to the operating room for a biopsy under anesthesia. Uh, if there isn't a lot of bleeding um, with the injection, then we proceed with biopsy in the office. Uh, and again, there's the advantage of one, avoiding debulking. And the second advantage is it allows you to uh, come up with a treatment plan without having to have two anesthetics for the patient. Uh, here's a patient who had a neuroendocrine carcinoma um, and uh, presented in the office. You can see it actually goes through the septum, involves both sides, there's erosion of the cranial base. And this was the view that I saw uh, in the office. You can see I've already done uh, my injection for a biopsy here, uh, and there's a little bit of bleeding there, but no uh, gross hemorrhage. Uh, so I elected to biopsy this in the office. And here we can see on the left side, the tumors on both sides here, it is medial to the middle turbine on the left. And, uh, Here's my injection sites here on the right, and you can take a couple little snips here and um, control the bleeding with silver nitrate. And it allows you to get a, a biopsy and uh, start your metastatic workup and uh, uh, make a plan for definitive therapy. So in terms of managing sinonasal malignancies, <clears throat> the tumor, uh, once we've got the diagnosis, is then debulked uh, to identify the attachment site. One of the advantages of the endoscopic approach as opposed to the open approach is that we can identify uh, where the tumor uh, begins. Uh, these tumors often grow by expansion and not direct invasion. And what I mean by that is that the tumor may have a, a small attachment site, but there can be a large expansion, uh, erosion and displacing of the lamina propitia, intracranial structures. And if you just looked at the imaging alone, you might suspect that a patient would need an orbital exoneration or more extensive resection than they really do. Uh, this was some of the problems with the open craniofacial approaches is that they were more of an operation, an on-block operation than actually a, a procedure that had attention to the attachment point. Because we can not see and identify the attachment point, especially when there's a single attachment point, this allows us to do a wider um, oncologic resection around the attachment point. It also allows us to identify and explain to our radiation therapist, therapy colleagues that uh, radiation can be focused at a certain area and does not have to have such a diffuse pattern that they would do just based on the imaging. There are some tumors that have broad-based um, attachments. And in these cases, obviously, we need to do an extensive, extensive resection of the attachment point with oncologic margins around. Uh, we also try and look at reconstructive options at the beginning. Uh, often with these tumors, there uh, is a septal flap on the contralateral side that can be available. So we always try and preserve the sphenopalatine artery uh, if possible. Obviously, if uh, this uh, interferes with oncologic principles, then uh, that septal flap cannot be used for reconstruction. Uh, the margins are obviously dictated by the tumor biology. Um, in certain cases, especially uh, with uh, uh, Sinonasal malignancies, you can do a unilateral craniofacial uh, resection. And the limits of a resection typically are from the orbit to orbit and from the posterior table to the planum. Um, so, corridors to the anterior cranial phallusa, um, uh, we clearly like to review the imaging preoperatively. Uh, as I explained earlier, the bony anatomy is um, usually well. Um, 
visualized on the CT scan and then the soft tissue um, uh, components are on the MRI. We look for things like septal deviation, pneumatization patterns of the sinuses, uh, involvement of uh, adjacent tissue or intracranial extension, uh, things like intercarotid distance and location of septal septations in the sphenoid. So here's an example of some of the information we can get from a CT scan. Uh, here's a patient who's got multiple sphenoid septations. You can see some of the septations insert onto the carotid artery, and these are important things to be aware of as we're doing our approaches. Uh, you can also see uh, anatomic variations like anode cells uh, with a dehiscent optic nerve. Uh, this is a picture of an intraoperative photo, and you can see the optic nerve and the optical carotid recess. And so again, the CT scan serves as a roadmap of what the patient's anatomy is and where the danger areas are. And the MRI is useful for uh, identifying the tumor and extension of the tumor. Uh, we also try and consider reconstruction uh, from the beginning. Again, if we can possibly uh, preserve a nasal septal flap, uh, we'll do this. Uh, sometimes we'll start out with a tunnel if we're not sure we need to do a, um, a flap, but if a septoplasty uh, is needed for access. And we also try and be minimally destructive to preserve mucosa for grafts and preserve long preserve long term sinus sequelae. We try and avoid resecting uh, normal structures like middle turbinates. So basically, we have a transcribiform uh, approach for pathology of the fovea and cribiform. We can also do a unilateral uh, versus a bilateral, and we can also do something called a septal transposition, which I'll describe in a little bit. Uh, we can do transphenoidal, transcellar, and transplanum approaches, and this is often for meningiomas, craniopharyngiomas, or uh, pituitaries with supracellular extension. So here's an artist's uh, rendition of the various uh, approaches to the anterocranial base uh, for resection. We can do a unilateral craniofacial resection. We can do a bilateral craniofacial resection. And although we're not talking about um, maxillectomies, you can also do an endoscopic medial maxillectomy. Uh, so as a typical uh, example of a transcribiform approach, a uh, 63-year-old male with a right-sided esthesioneuroblastoma, uh, we planned a unilateral endoscopic transcribiform resection with fasciolata button graft and a nasal septal flap reconstruction. So here is preoperative imaging, and we can see the mass in the nasal cavity. Uh, there is some post-obstructive um, uh, mucus in the frontal sinus, but there doesn't appear to be gross involvement of the uh, uh, cranial base. Uh, here we are endoscopically, and again, we try and uh, work around and see if we can identify the attachment point early. Uh, tumors this large often you can't, and we need to start out by uh, endoscopic debulking. Uh, we'll often use the suction bovi to shrink down the capsule and cut down on bleeding. We also do this in juvenile angiofibromas. And as you can see, if you keep working on the tumor and uh, bovi before you divide it, you can see out here too that, that the tumor expands the uh, nasal structures and it doesn't necessarily erode. You can see this is what I mean by tumor in space. And with even larger tumors, you'll see extensive expansion, but the mucosa over the orbit and cranial base and other structures is often normal. So here we are again debulking, and now we've got it down to a small uh, attachment point. And this is what's critical about this approach is by, by getting a small attachment point and identifying it, we can now perform a wide oncologic resection about this. This visualization allows us to do probably better oncologic margins than the open craniofacial uh, with uh, lateral rhinotomy and bifrontal craniotomy. So here we are removing the uh, remainder of the soft tissue along the cranial base, trying to expose the uh, bone of the cribriform plate. We've essentially removed all of the attachment here and we're down to the bone over the uh, cribriform plate. And next, we'll start performing our osteotomies along the anterocranial fossa. 
and we'll start exposing the dura. A little bit of a leak already there. And then once we have the uh, bone resected along the fovea and the cribriform, uh, we have the dural uh, exposed. Uh, and again, all of this is being done as a margin, but you can see how we can focus and make sure we do an oncologic margin around the attachment point. Uh, we then incise the dura. And because it's an olfactory neuroblastoma, uh, we like to get the olfactory neuroepithelium. Again, this is a unilateral approach, and uh, we've been very successful with unilateral approach uh, followed by postoperative radiation therapy. And here we are resecting the olfactory bulb and apparatus. And this gives us an extra margin and uh, theoretically should give us a large oncological section. And in this case, again, we believe a unilateral craniofacial is appropriate. So now we've got our dural defect. <clears throat> and we typically repair this using our bilayer uh, button graft. It's basically an inlay onlay graft, which is sutured to itself uh, and resists mo motion of the graft in both the horizontal and vertical direction. Uh, the main reason for graft failure and uh, high flow uh, reconstructions is graft migration. And uh, the button basically restricts mo uh, movement in both the horizontal and vertical plane. We then cover it up with a uh, septal flap. You can see we color the uh, mucosa of the septal flap blue so that at the end of the case, we know which side is the mucosa. Once we get the flap in place, we usually cover that with a little bit of biologic glue. So we've got a primary dural repair with the button, a vascularized nasal septal flap. And that really is all that's needed to close the cranial base defect. We don't use any heavy um, non-absorbable packing. We do use a small amount of um, nasopore to uh, stabilize the flap, but that alone is enough given the button's uh, ability to stay in position uh, to control high flow um, cranial base defects. And there's a post-operative uh, CT, uh, pretty normal appearance, uh, excellent resection. Um, you can see that um, turbinates are intact, except for on the right side, which we resected as part of, part of the resection. Uh, and he's about five years out with no evidence of recurrence. There's another approach that we use for uh, patients that have midline anterior cranial base lesions. Uh, these are mostly olfactory um, uh, groove meningiomas that have been uh, growing, and the patient already has no sense of smell. Uh, the disadvantage of this flap is that uh, it does sacrifice olfaction, but it does essentially give us exposure as if there's a complete septectomy. It also uh, leaves the contralateral nasal septal flap available if needed in the future. Um, disadvantages are really pretty minor uh, as long as they are osmic to begin with. Uh, steps involved are the uh, flap is harvested uh, and the contralateral uh, hemitransfixion incision is performed. We elevate superior and inferior tunnels and leave the mucosa and bone attached in the middle portion of the septum. We then make incisions uh, inferiorly and superiorly along the septum submucosally, and then the septum is transposed. And, uh, just to show kind of what's going on here, these tunnels are made uh, inferiorly and superiorly, and then we, we cut the bone and cartilage superiorly and the bone and cartilage inferiorly. Um, and uh, the mucosa is still adherent to the cartilage and the uh, bone on both sides. <clears throat> And this is uh, another artist view. So this is um, this is an example of uh, uh, the artist view of the septal transposition. But what you can see here is the septal flap's been raised on the patient's left side. On the right side, we've got the cartilage and the bone attached to the septal mucosa. Uh, 
Uh, we've elevated an inferior tunnel and a superior tunnel and cut the bone and cartilage along here. And then the septum with its bone and cartilage is able to be transposed into the right side of the nose. And we essentially have a wide open nose with no nasal septum um, um, and great exposure if, if olfaction has been compromised uh, preoperatively. So here's a video of the uh, approach. So the flap's already been raised on this side. We're gonna make an incision in the cartilage. On the opposite side, we're gonna raise a superior and an inferior uh, flap. Here we are cutting superiorly the bone and cartilage along the cranial base. And now we're gonna do a inferior tunnel and sweep that mucosa out laterally and do inferior cuts. And then we can now take the entire septum, which is attached to the um, mucosa and push it over. So you can see here it is before we push it over. Now we're pushing over the entire septum bone cartilage attached to the mucosa. Here's the opposite contralateral septal flap. And that now gives us a complete exposure of the cranial base. This is the nasal septum from the right side transposed into the right nasal cavity with the bone and cartilage attached. The left septal flap is tucked in the nasal pharynx and we essentially have the exposure that a complete septectomy would give you, but without resecting the septum. And this is its appearance of a couple of weeks post-op. You can see how normal this nose looks. There's the middle turbinate, we didn't resect it. It's been uh, lateralized. You can see the middle meatus looks pretty normal. And this is the opposite side, the septal flap side starting to be coastalized, but pretty normal looking nose uh, this soon after surgery and an intact septum. Now in terms of the transphenoidal approach, there are multiple approaches to the uh, cella and the plenum sphenoidale. Um, varying degrees of uh, sphenoidotomy are required for access depending on the size of the tumor. Uh, the Thomas, Thomas Jefferson approach uh, tries to make sure that we always have one septal flap uh, available at the end of the procedure and often two. Uh, we're minimally destructive. We lateralize the middle turbines. We don't resect them. And we do a, a small posterior septectomy. The goal again is preservation of nasal flat, septal flat pedicle. And we usually can pres uh, preserve both of them. Uh, and the approaches involve uh, unilateral, which obviously only uh, requires sacrifice of one flap and it preserves the one on the contralateral side. Our most common approach is a sphenoidotomy with a small contralateral sphenoidotomy. The 1.5 approach with push down that I'll describe later. And then there's a septoplasty approach. And this is used if the patient has a severe septal deformity, we can elevate a septal tunnel or uh, as we would with a normal septoplasty and use that to preserve the flap and gain access to the cranial base. Uh, the 1.5 approach involves performing a wide right-sided sphenoidotomy with a pushdown and a small contralateral sphenoidotomy on the left side for endoscopic placement. And while we do things somewhat differently at Jefferson, where we hold the scope in the left side uh, and use the instruments through the right side, or sometimes even instruments through the right and left side for a four-handed approach, um, this still should be able to be used for a four-handed approach as well. We connect the sphenoidotomy with a small posterior septectomy, and this preserves the pedicle on both sides. It's kind of hard to display this uh, uh, artistically, but just to give you the idea, on the right side, we're going to do a fairly wide mucosal opening into the sphenoid, but preserving the septal flap. And on the left side, our mucosal opening is just going to be uh, from the sphenoid os superiorly. In both cases, we do a complete resection submucosally of the bone of the face of the sphenoid. Um, this is um, a septal approach or the tunnel approach. And in this patient, if they had a septal deviation on the left, we would raise a septal tunnel like we were doing a sphenoid uh, septoplasty. We then fracture the posterior bony spine here, elevate the mucosa on the right side as well, and push that down that allows us to do a complete bony resection from the plenum to the floor of the sinus and from orbit to orbit. So we always have a complete uh, wide sphenoidotomy, bony sphenoidotomy with much smaller mucosal sphenoidotomies. <clears throat> 
So here's an uh, example of the 1.5 approach. And we start out by lateralizing the uh, middle terminates. Until we can see the sphenoid os. And then an incision is made in the nasal septum mucosa. And then the bone of the uh, posterior nasal septum is fractured over. <clears throat> this is the sphenoid os on the right side. And we've opened up from the sphenoid os superiorly. So this is our wide sphenoidotomy here. And we'll start elevating submucosally all of the mucosa on the left side preserving the flap. And on this side, we'll push down the mucosa to preserve the flap. It's somewhat like a rescue flap, but we don't actually make the cut up along the septum uh, unless we need it. So here you can see the right sphenoid, and now we'll elevate the mucosa off the face of the sphenoid. There's the sphenoid os from the left. We'll take down the uh, sphenoid rostrum and using various coros punches, widely do a submucous or submucosal resection of the bone of the face of the sphenoid, the inner sinus septum, the upper clivus, and the inner sinus septum as well. You can see a fairly typical pituitary. It's been expanded. There's even tumor pooching out uh, down below. Now, here we are on the left side, and here's the sphenoid os. We haven't touched it yet, except for what we did from the opposite side. And here's this, the uh, septal flap on the right side with the push down. Uh, and we come back to the left. And we're going to take off a little bit of the membranous posterior uh, septum to get a better view with our scope through this side. But again, nothing has been resected below the inferior aspect of the sphenoid os. And this gives us a wide exposure of the cella. And uh, in terms of preservation of function, here we go postoperatively. Here's the uh, left side, very small. Sphenoidotomy, the mucosa has already started to heal. I'll go through that in a little bit. Uh, and here we are on the right side, middle turbinates well medialized, the uncinal process, the middle meatus is wide open, healthy looking nose. And this is the push down side, a little wider, but you can see uh, how well this heals and how minimally destructive these procedures are. The septal tunnel, as I mentioned, uh, is uh, similar to the sublabial microscopic approaches we used to do. Uh, it's indicated when there's a large septal spur or deviation. Um, it avoids the mucosal tear and postoperative perforation. Uh, so we typically raise this on the side of the spur. I know a lot of centers do the opposite, but our concern is that if we uh, use the flap from the non-deviated side and then try and take the spur out on the deviated side, we'll end up with a tear in the flap and we'll end up with a large septal perforation. Uh, we've looked at our series and uh, we showed that even if you do have a tear in your septal flap, there's no uh, increased rate of CSF leak. So we don't really mind if we get a small tear in the flap as we're elevating it, leaving the opposite uh, septal mucosa attached to the bone and cartilage prevents you from getting the, um, the septal perforation. So here's a typical uh, uh, septal tunnel approach or septoplasty approach. And we've already elevated the uh, mucosa on the right side. And this is the face of the sphenoid. We're starting to take down the bone of the face of the sphenoid. And there's the keel. We fractured the bone off the face of the sphenoid again. And here's the sphenoid os on the left side. <clears throat> again, we can submucosally take down all the bone from the planum to the floor and from the orbit to orbit. And again, we'll have a wide exposure of the cella again, because the cell is usually expanded. You can just eggshell this bone. Um, using the uh, bottle, and then use your uh, kerosens to widely open the uh, cellar bone and expose the cellar dura. Uh, this happened to be a fairly uh, soft and uh, suckable tumor. Um, and then after internal debulking and extracapsular dissection, we've got what we would consider a patchless diaphragm. I'll go over that in a little bit. And these patchless diaphragms, we typically will repair using a piece of uh, synthetic dura. You can see the dural edges and how well this is going to heal. Now, there's no uh, CSF leak, but if there had, then we would have used that as well. So we typically do that for either a CSF leak or um, patchless diaphragm. And here we are a couple weeks later. This is the left side. Again, that small superior sphenoidotomy. <clears throat> um, and the same thing here on the 
left side, the other side was the right side. I'm sorry, I really raised this up. That's bad. But both sides, pretty normal appearing. That's probably the uh, blue, blue starting to mobilize. But a really normal looking nose. Both septal flaps are preserved uh, and weren't needed in that case, but are also available if you ever need them in the future. In terms of plant transplanum, this is a typical uh, patient, 60 year old female with uh, tuberculin meningioma. And uh, this is a good example of an extended cellar, uh, transcellar approach. A typical meningioma with dural tail. This is an excellent candidate for an endoscopic approach. Uh, in patients that have meningiomas or craniopharyngiomas, we do start at the beginning by raising the septal flap. You need to be careful with the bovi on the superior cut. We usually turn it down to six or seven because you can perforate right through the septum with that. I don't know if you can see it, but we also have a number eight nasal tracheal tube uh, attached to the um, um, bovi to suction the smoke. We're now starting to make the coinal cuts, and these cuts will come down along like this. And the limitation of rotation for the septal flaps is really the coenal cut here. And if at the end of the case you need more exposure, you can keep extending this out further uh, laterally. Um, you can even, if it, you need a lot more exposure, uh, identify this uh, sphenopalatine foramen and artery and trace it back to the internal maxillary artery and get a little extra um, mobility by mobilizing uh, back to the artery. Um, these cuts along the floor, make sure you do two or three cuts down here. Uh, that bone, that mucos is often thick. Now here we cut un, up, come up under the inferior turbinate. This gives us a really wide flap. And just like I said before, we uh, color it purple uh, with a marker so we know its side is uh, the mucosa. Yes, after sitting in the nasopharynx for several hours, it can be difficult to determine which side is the um, uh, mucosa. So now that we've got the flap tucked into the nasopharynx, uh, we'll start our uh, sphenoidotomy and posterior septectomy. Um, it's important that you do that you drill down the upper clivus uh, when you're doing the approach. Uh, if you leave the clivus uh, or the face of the sphenoid high, then the septal flap will get tethered over that and can uh, cause a uh, mucosal uh, and also limit the amount of rotation that you can get out of the flap. So. Do this at the beginning. If uh, at the end of the case you realize you need to do it, your exposure is not as good, and everybody's tired. Um, <clears throat> we then start uh, taking down the septations in the sphenoid and then start drilling down the bone over the cella as opposed to the uh, pituitary tumors. Uh, this bone has not been expanded and won't eggshell with a caudal, and uh, you need to use a drill to start opening up the uh, cella. Once we get a little opening, then we can start using our. Uh, Poros punches or kerosens to uh, take down the cranial base and uh, clean them. Uh, we then take down the optic canals. Uh, Dr. Evans likes to uh, say that this should look like a t-shirt with the arms being out here and the body being down here. So we drill out the optic canals bilaterally. Obviously using a diamond burr. And once we've got our, our t-shirt and our dura exposed, um, we can start our resection. Um, again, the advantage of the endoscopic approach to these tumors is uh, that we get early control of the blood supply. Um, so the dura is incised. And internal debulking and extra capsular dissection has begun. And uh, if you notice, Dr. Evans doesn't do any pulling, everything that uh, is done in terms of tumor dissection is under direct vision. Uh, there's no blind pulling and uh, risk of avulsing vessels that are attached to the backside of the tumor. Uh, he keeps rolling out the, cap the tumor capsule and identifying anything that's attached to it before he cuts. Uh, everything is done with sharp dissection, obviously. There's the optic chiasm and the uh, infundibulum. But again, uh, internal debulking, extra capsular dissection, and attention to detail without pulling and ripping of tissue. Uh, and now we have our uh, standard defect. And this again is going to be reconstructed with our bilayer button uh, graph, the inlay portion being 25% larger than the onlay portion. The sutures uh, that hold it together are smaller than the size of the dural defect. The inlay portion is 25% larger than the onlay. The onlay is going to be smaller than the um, size of the bony defect. 
and you can already see it starting to pulse like Dura. Uh, handles like Dura, it looks like Dura. And this is a good primary dural repair, water pipe closure. Uh, and then again, we'll follow that up with a septal flap. Uh, you can see the blue color on it um, from the uh, marking at the beginning. We follow that up with some biologic glue. And then we'll put some nasopore in there. Uh, we don't use any heavy packing like balloons or gaskets to uh, uh, secure the graft. The biggest reason for uh, failure of high flow leaks is graft migration and the bilayer button uh, based on its ability to be tethered to itself keeps it from moving in those two directions. And that brings us to reconstructive considerations. Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about uh, pressure versus flow. Uh, we like to uh, look at it in this way. And uh, unfortunately, there's no universal descriptions of high flow, low flow, high pressure, low pressure uh, as it relates to cranial based reconstruction. So you'll often hear high flow and high pressure used interchangeably, and that's really not true. Uh, we like to look at it based on defect size. And if you take small defects, uh, patients with a small cranial based defect with normal pressure, uh, typical iatrogenic uh, injuries, uh, traumatic injuries and pituitary tumors are essentially normal pressure and what we would call either normal flow or low flow. <clears throat> the other side of the small defect is the high pressure uh, patients. These are the patients with elevated intracranial pressure. They usually have encephaloceles or meningoencephaloceles or meningoceles. And the reason that uh, the high pressure is the cause is that when you have a small bony opening in the cranial base with large herniation of uh, intracranial contents, the only way to get that through that small opening is with high pressure. It's almost like squeezing toothpaste through a toothpaste uh, uh, tube. And so they're high pressure and theoretically they're high flow, but um, it's really not a good term. And really, we like to think of them purely as just high pressure. And then we get to the large defects. And large defects are greater than two centimeters and there's communication with ventricles or cisterns. These are patients that have normal pressure, the typical craniopharyngiomas, the sinonasal malignancies, meningiomas, and they are considered high flow leaks. Uh, and again, that's why this terminology is not great, but normal pressure, high flow, high pressure, high flow, I don't know, normal flow. The, the flow terminology is not great and probably should be looked at more based on their size and communication with um, ventricles and systems. There's a lot of reconstruction options, uh, and the choice is dependent on the size and location of the defect and intracranial pressure. Vascularized tissue is superior for larger defects and uh, elevated intracranial pressure. Uh, small defects uh, can be repaired with just about anything, and, and they will uh, heal. But if there is something uh, vascularized nearby, it's always worth rotating it into place. So cellar reconstruction, we would consider a low flow leak. It's a normal pressure, low flow, normal low flow, whatever you'd like to call it. Uh, high success with allografts or autographs. Uh, and the exceptions are obviously going to be craniopharyngiomas, large pituitary adenomas with extensive supercellar extension, and something we call a fish mouth defect, which is a little hard to explain. So cellar reconstruction, again, it's on this arm of the tree. It's a normal flow or low flow, but it's normal pressure. Uh, and so we've got um, a fairly um, straightforward approach to cellar reconstruction. Uh, we start out with a low risk group. These are patients that have no intraoperative leak and no evidence of a pantulous diaphragm. And we repair them purely with just a piece of surge cell. If we have a patient who's got a low flow or a small intraoperative leak and a patchless diaphragm, we'll use a dural substitute followed by um, a um, dural sealant. Uh, if we've got a high flow leak, again, greater than two centimeters commun communication with cisterns or ventricles, or a low flow intraoperative leak with rich risk factors, usually um, fish mouth or sometimes uh, severe obstructive sleep apnea, we'll use a septal flap. And you can see our rates are pretty good across the board here. And if you combine them all, it's an overall leak rate for our pituitary is a 1.5%. And here's a video of what the surge cell closure looks like. <clears throat> we just take a piece of surge cell, uh, place it on the uh, defect, the dural defect, and uh, you can see how well this heals. Uh, here's endoscopy one week later. 
See the middle turbinate is well medialized, normal looking anatomy. This is the right side, it's the uh, push down side, uh, and you can see the dural pulsations there. Uh, but a really good reconstruction, fairly normal nose. Here's the left side, the 0.5 side. Again, middle meatus is open, nice middle turbinate, unsinent process. And again, this is the 0.5 side we've removed from the sphenoid os superiorly. And again, you can see how well that dura pair starts to get incorporated. And then by three weeks, you can see again, this is the left side. And over that three week period, it's no longer pulsating, it's tightened up. Everything's been coastalized, normal appearing nose, very uh, inexpensive, simple. Uh, straightforward approach, middle meatus, unsinent process, normal anatomy, uh, and great reconstruction. Uh, so the other reason we'll do that type of repair, just to show you what a patchless diaphragm is, and this is probably about 14, 15 years ago that we did this one. That's when we started realizing that if there was a patchless diaphragm, it would probably be a good idea to reconstruct that. So someone who's got a a very patchless diaphragm at the end of the procedure, we'll get that dura pair. And that's, uh, here's an example of the uh, dura pair. Piece of inlay, you can see the dural leaves here. We'll put a little bit of dural substitute on there. And dural glue, you know, biologic glue. And again, post-operative appearances are really very nice. This is one week post-op. And several weeks later. Uh, the fish mouth defect I'm not gonna get into. I'll just quickly say that it's when we have a leak securely at the junction of the diaphragm, and the cellar dura, and we can't really get the uh, graft to lay flat. Uh, so these patients, we would, uh, you can see it's still leaking, we would use a septal flap. And you can see this is a patient that we needed a septal flap at the end of the case. Again, they're always available. Uh, you can see how easy it is to just go ahead and raise that flap up quickly. Uh, now that we ended up needing it for a fish mouth. And, uh, we slowed this video down a little for the uh, presentation. Uh, but again, you can just throw your flap up there quickly and it's always available if you need it at the end of the case. Um, the bilayered button graft, you heard me mention this earlier. It's our uh, primary dural repair for high flow leaks. Uh, again, most of the um, uh, procedures for closure of high flow leaks will include a dural primary dural repair, as well as a means of stabilization, followed by a vascularized flap. Um, some people use balloons to stabilize the graft. Some people use gaskets. Uh, we use the button graft, which uh, provides stabilization in both uh, the horizontal and vertical planes. Uh, there's an inlay and onlay uh, graft doubles the surface area for closure. It provides an early watertight closure. It is a primary dural repair. It's not a packing or a stuffing. It's a primary dural repair because it's attached to itself. It allows easy manipulation of the inlay and onlay. And we prefer uh, autologous material. Fasciolata is our, our uh, material of choice. It looks, feels, and uh, acts like dura, but you can use synthetics for this. So again, we harvest a piece of fasciolata, usually about four by eight centimeters. Uh, this is the artist rendition of the um, uh, button graft. <clears throat> and basically there's a bilayer button graft, an inlay and an onlay portion. The inlay portion is 25% larger than the onlay. The sutures need to be within the size of the dural defect. And then the onlay portion is usually smaller than the um, uh, bony defect. And you can see here again, this is the dural defect here. The sutures are within the size of the dural defect. The onlay portion is within the bony uh, margins and the uh, inlay is about 25% larger. 
And again, this resists movement in both the horizontal and vertical planes. It's a very stable graph and cuts down on leak rate tremendously. This is a video, it's probably 12 or 13 years, but it hasn't changed at all. So we've got our inlay and onlay secured with these uh, four ohm neurons. Uh, this is a craniopharyngioma defect. And uh, we can take the graft and start placing it in. Uh, we start getting the inlay portion in first. And uh, as you can see, once you get the inlay portion in, we can pull on the onlay portion to start getting it into position. So here we're pulling up and as you pull up, you're, you're still tethered to the inlay portion and you can use it to position both, uh, both graphs. And uh, as we start getting it into position, you can already see it's starting to pulsate. We've already got a watertight seal, even though we haven't completely made sure that all of our edges are, are well opposed. So here's the inlay portion, here's the dural defect. And we can go around with a, a curette and just make sure that the inlay portion isn't bunched up on itself and make sure that it's laying flat on the dura. Again, the uh, onlay portion is uh, smaller than the size of the bony defect. And as we keep working, um, we can check, you can see how already this is very well opposed. The inlay portion of the graft to the native dura, it's forming a watertight primary dural seal. And then we place the onlay portion and again, they are tethered together, so it's not going to move in the horizontal or vertical direction. It's resistant to motion. Um, and then again, we can throw a septal flap up there. And uh, biologic glue, as we talked about. Uh, in terms of vascularized flaps, nasal septal flap is the work colors. Uh, there are some options. These uh, middle turbine and inferior turbine flaps are not very good for large defects. Uh, if there is a large defect and the flaps aren't available because of previous surgery, radiation, uh, then pericranial temporal parietal fascial flaps are uh, excellent choices. And in some cases, free flaps can be used. The HB flap, as I said before, it has to be prepared uh, at the beginning of the case unless you use some of the Jefferson approaches. Uh, that usually makes you raise as large a flap as uh, possible. Uh, the incisions come from the sphenoid os superiorly and through the coena. And again, this coenal cut here is what's gonna limit your rotation. So if you need more rotation, you can extend that cut down further. We typically take the flap up under the inferior terminate and along the medial maxilla. Um, so limitations of the endoscopic approaches, uh, if there's involvement of the anterior table of the frontal sinus, uh, this will usually require a bicoronal approach. Uh, lateral anterior wall of the maxillary sinuses can be addressed with Caldwell Luck uh, or Denkers or a prelateral approach. Uh, extension past the midline of the orbit is a relative contraindication. It's somewhat difficult to get out that far laterally and often requires an open approach. Uh, obviously, you've got orbital invasion and you'll need to be doing, uh, doing an orbital incineration. Uh, then it's an open approach, although we will use a, a open endoscopic approach in some of these patients to still do uh, majority of the uh, endonasal portion endoscopically. Uh, extensive intracranial involvement uh, usually requires an open approach. And obviously, if there's soft tissue involvement of the skin uh, or the palate, uh, these areas need to be resectioned and by definition converted to an open procedure. Uh, the vast majority of diseases in the anterior cranial base can be safely managed endoscopically. Uh, we've shown this that uh, now that um, we can do this safely, uh, we should try and be more uh, minimally destructive. Uh, there are multiple quarters that can be used but are dictated by the pathology. Once again, the goal of the endoscope approach should be the same as open. And this used to be more of an issue than it was before. And I, I think that most of us that do this and uh, most of the data support that these approaches uh, are superior to the open approach. So endoscopic approaches to the anterior skull base have been evolved and are now considered the primary approach for most pathology of the anterior cranial base. Uh, the safety of these approaches has been established and now the focus is on preservation of function and structure. Reconstructive challenges have been solved and post-operative leak rates are comparable to open approaches. And again, please do not debulk a skull base or sinonasal uh, malignancy, always biopsy first. Uh, the ultimate outcome has been shown uh, very clearly by Dr. Hanna and uh, MD Anderson, that um, if the tumors are debulked and the definitive surgery is not performed uh, by the original surgeon, the outcomes are severely worse. So thank you very much.
and I hope you enjoyed this presentation.